Hello. Um, so, Martin is a very difficult speaker to follow. Um, and uh, hopefully by playing the bad cop, good cop routine, um, I'll you know, make up for any lack of eloquence that, that Martin has an abundance of. Um, so I'm Jure Triglau. I work as a lead developer for the Coco Foundation. Um, I'll talk about the Coco Foundation a bit more uh, later. But um, basically, we're an open source uh, collaborative knowledge foundation. Um, and we have various goals for, we just, uh, we just started, but we have various goals for the near future. Um, I want to go back, say, 300 years and talk about how science was written in the age of Benjamin Franklin, who I found was maybe the only scientist of, of renown born in Boston. <laughs> it's, it's weird, but Wikipedia didn't help. Google didn't help. It was just Benjamin Franklin. So I said, what the heck? You know, it's, it's a good start. Um, and how did Benjamin Franklin write his experiments, write his science? Well, at that time, you know, people wrote maybe 100 papers a year. Like, together, the scientific output of the world was very, very small. And Benjamin basically read it all. And he had everything in his head. And when he was writing a, a paper, he basically thought about what he's, what he's read and said, oh, it was Burnett and, and Winston's theory of the earth, sure, and cited it like that, just off the top of his head, and produced miraculous things. He discovered how lightning is made out of electricity and uh, bifocal glasses and stuff that, you know, is amazing. Um, fast forward 200 years. Albert Einstein. What tools did he use to write his science? Similar as Benjamin Franklin. He used a pencil, he used a pen, and mostly he had stuff in his head. He knew almost all the people in his field, collaborated with them by sitting next to Oppenheimer or Bohr. And just, you know, hey, this is Bohr, let's write some stuff together. Um, <laughs> so this is 200 years later. And he's using a pencil, and you will note that uh, the first person, or among the first people to sell pencils in the States was Benjamin Franklin. So this is in the span of 200 years. We went from pen and pencil to pen and pencil. And then fast forward another 100 years. And now we have laptops. And how do we write science today? Is it any different than it was 300 years ago? You read papers. We remember what was in those papers, and we're writing, when we're writing our own paper, we say, ah, oh, it was this guy. It was Gunther in 2005, his paper. OK, cite. So nothing has radically changed. While the output of science has gone from 100 papers globally a year to millions, like I think in 2010, 1.4 million papers were published. So nobody knows the entire content of science anymore. It's impossible, even, you know, even remotely. Nobody knows all of the people in their field. There are some fields that are very, very small, and maybe there's 10 people. I'm not saying it's not possible still, but the vast majority of people um, in a certain field do not know each other, and they produce vast amounts of research. So how do we make this better? How do we improve science writing and, and take into account this increase in this tsunami of papers that is coming. If you look at the publication rate, or if you look at the rate of uh, papers published per year, it's an exponential graph. So this is a problem that needs to be dealt with. Um, and these are the kinds of things that we're exploring at the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation. This is a new foundation, like I said before. It's funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation, and it's founded by Adam Hyde and Kristen. Um, and it's an, it's an open community that aims to build open source tools um, for collaborative knowledge generation. So for generation of knowledge that is fit for the modern age. And um, what it wants to do is it wants to modernize and democratize knowledge production. So a lot of science is still produced in first world countries. Um, and it's not really accessible to produce science in, in most of the world. 
we want to build a community of people who share this goal that science is to be produced by everyone, that everyone can have access to the tools to produce science. And we want this to be based on an open, uh, an open community and an open source um, solution. And we want to bring collaboration um, to the creation of knowledge. So just like Einstein was sitting next to Oppenheimer and Bohr, we want to bring people together across the world, um, not probably not sitting be behind the same table, but probably behind computers uh, millions of miles. Not millions of miles, that would be crazy. But maybe, you know, maybe when we colonize Mars. Um, so what does this have to do with Crossref? Um, some of the things we're exploring deal with understanding the entirety of scientific output. And there's a nice thing that Crossref has that is a proxy to that content, and that's the API. <laughs> you can query the API that Crossref has with a query. You can say, give me everything you have on lasers that is CC by licensed. And Crossref will spit out a bunch of stuff, a bunch of content that you couldn't know otherwise. You could Google on Google Scholar. It would give you 50,000 results or 60,000 results. But what then? What do you do with these 60,000 results? Who has time to read through all of these papers, memorize it, understand what they're about? And I think it's at this point we need computers to help us write science. It's no longer possible for a single person to have even their own field in their mind. But even if they do, they miss out on the collaboration part, the interdisciplinary collaboration between other fields. So one of, I was a researcher before, and one of the most interesting things that I did was look at other fields, look at what they did, and try to apply it to my own field. And it was, it was really, really nice. And if you miss out if you, don't, if you don't read the entirety of science, which you cannot. So computers, we need computers to help us. And at Coco, we call it Coco, it's kind of, it's kind of cute. <laughs> at Coco, we do these kinds of prototypes, these kinds of experiments. Coco is a continuation of some of the software that Adam was working on before, um, the, the Pub Suite platform. And our first, one of our first prototypes, we're about two months old. Our, one of our first prototypes is the Science Blogger. And for example, in the Science Blogger, you could say, I wrote a letter to Marie Curie. The Science Blogger would automatically query the Crossref API, get all of the results for Marie Curie, find the context where Marie Curie was, was mentioned, which you can see on the right-hand side, and you could just click and insert that reference. Now, obviously, this is a very crude example. You can go very, very deep into how you process these results, what kind of natural language processing you use to extract the context, to cite these papers. Um, but it's something that we'll have to do because it's becoming unmanageable. So it's time for a demo. Live demos, we haven't seen one today. Um, you know, fingers crossed. Let's go back to, to Benjamin. Um, so how would he write his experiment where he flew a kite and discovered that lightning is made out of, out of electricity? How would he write that today? Um, so flying a kite, it was stormy. Maybe he would say, this morning I flew a kite into a storm cloud, fine and say, I think I discovered. Oh, OK. See, live demos. <coughs> we'll fix that. Can you see now? Wow, that's, that's very small. OK. So maybe he would say, I think I discovered a lightning <coughs> rod. Oh, lightning rods. Monson's improved lightning rod. Hold on. Am I not the person who discovered the lightning rod? OK, whatever. He would just go and say, I'll just cite Monson's improved lightning rod. The reference gets inserted. He says, <laughs> closes his, he saves the, saves the paper, closes his work, um, and says, OK, I'm, I'm off for the day. And immediately, as he saves this, this is published. Uh, OK, maybe not. Missing the last part. But basically, when he saves this, 
um, it goes into the backend, is saved as a blog post, and everyone can view that, um, that output. Unfortunately, it's not working here. There's a bug. Um, but this kind of enabling scientists to tap into this global uh, output and extracting useful things from this enormous um, sets of data is something that we'll have to do and it will be very interesting to explore um, in the future. Back to PowerPoint. That's it. <laughs>